Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Advancements in Prostate Cancer Diagnosis, and particularly the role of medical imaging and artificial intelligence. My name is Mark Wittenberg, and I'll be your horse host for this session today. First, I want to thank our sponsor, Kibim, for providing the resources to hold this forum. I am joined today by several prominent medical and AI experts from both Europe and the U.S., including Dr. Raj Gupta from Duke, Dr. Juan Morote from Val de Bron School of Medicine, and Dr. Bas Olskin from Kibim. As many of you know, prostate cancer is the second leading cause of cancer death in men in the world. Second leading cause of cancer death. Many people, however, are not up to speed on the latest advancements in detecting and treating prostate cancer. Like many cancers, early detection is critical to survival. Today, we will cover the latest imaging technology and biopsy technology in the fight against prostate cancer, as well as the role of artificial intelligence in identifying at-risk patients and diagnosing them accurately. To start, we will hear from Dr. Raj Gupta. Dr. Gupta is Chief of Abdominal Imaging at Duke University Medical Center and an international expert in prostate MRI. He has published extensively in the field of prostate and has been invited as a national and international speaker at many meetings, uh, universities, and medical congresses. Much of his work focuses on improving the detection and characterization of prostate cancer using cutting edge imaging techniques. So let me turn it over to Dr. Gupta and, and thank you for joining us, joining us today. Mark, thanks very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Wonderful to be here with you. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, hope everybody can see that. Again, uh, welcome to all of you and thank you all of you for being here. I'm Roger Gupta, Chief of Abdominal Imaging at Duke University Medical Center. So what I'd like to do in the next 10 minutes or so is talk a little bit about the state of prostate cancer today and specifically the role that MRI plays in its diagnosis. And then I wanna talk a little bit about some of the new challenges and some of the new frontiers uh, that are out there. So when we think about the current state of affairs for prostate cancer, it typically starts with PSA and DRE or digital rectal exam. Subsequently, we talk about trust guided biopsy and then we talk about radical prostatectomy. And so what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about each of these three things uh, before we go forward. So thinking about elevated PSA and abnormal DRE, PSA in the US has been very controversial. There's been some uh, recommendations of a D in 2012 uh, that had some significant downstream impact. The draft recommendation in 2018 went to a C, but the concept here is that PSA, although not a perfect screening test, is certainly something that needs to be in the uh, diagnostic work of prostate cancer. The digital rectal exam, is something that is obviously important, but it's biased towards higher grade disease, and it's uh, sometimes unreliable and operator dependent. Trust guided biopsy is usually the next step, and it's been a mainstay in diagnosis of prostate cancer for over 30 years, and it's really where you take 12 systematic cores from the prostate gland. So the real question that you ask yourself with a major diagnostic test is, does it work? And the, the thing that we know about trust guided biopsy is that the rate of positive biopsy is less than 10%. Um, there's not only the issue with a very low positivity rate, but also the problem with a few other conditions. So one of the major uh, criticisms of trust guided biopsy is overdetection, finding too much clinically insignificant cancer, which leads to the problem of overtreatment. One of the other issues with trust guided biopsy is the concept of failure to diagnose. And failure to diagnose is the idea that uh, either we have missed the cancer entirely, um, and that can lead to undertreatment and a delay in diagnosis. And then finally, we also know that up to 40% of cancers can be either missed or undergraded or underdetected by trust guided biopsy secondary use technique, and that can lead to inappropriate treatment selection. Specifically, that if you think you have a clinically insignificant tumor, you might go one direction when you actually have clinically significant tumor. Okay, so now we talk about radical prostatectomy. It's obviously a mainstay of surgical treatment for prostate cancer. Obviously, we have to ask ourselves, is it necessary in all cases? And the other options that we have here are gonna be active surveillance, uh, which has taken on an increased role over the last number of years, and also the possibility that we do with other organs like focal therapy. Obviously with radical prostatectomy, we're talking about some very significant 
uh, life side effects, including incontinence and impotence. So we really have to figure out how do we determine the operative plan? And typically that is done using the partner tables and that's a clinical nomogram. This clinical nomogram is really intended to predict the pathologic stage of diagnosis at the time of radical prostatectomy and really to differentiate the critically important um, binary idea of organ confined and non-organ confined disease. And it's based on the inputs of serum PSA, which we just talked about as being unreliable, clinical stage based on DRE, which we talked about as very operator dependent, and biopsy Gleason score, which we just talked about, has some significant uh, rates of under detection and under grading. And so one thing to realize is that for a very long time, no imaging was used routinely to preoperatively stage prostate cancer prior to radical prostatectomy. And thankfully, that is not the case anymore. And so when we really take a look at our current state of affairs, the big question you might be asking yourself is where is MRI? And so let's talk about the role of MRI. In the current state of affairs, MRI, and I'm going to show a couple of seminal papers that talked about this thing, it's proven that it does what it needs to do. And what is it that it needs to do? When we talk about appropriately treating patients, we need to make sure that we increase the diagnosis of clinically significant prostate cancer and appropriately stage the disease. The second thing we need to do to mitigate against the concept of overtreatment is to really decrease the diagnosis of low-grade prostate cancer. And when we do have it, be confident in its diagnosis. And that's the way that we can decrease mortality and morbidity from this disease. Seminal paper in JAMA 2015 really talked about comparison of MRI ultrasound fusion guided biopsy with, the, uh, with traditional systematic cores. And then over 1,000 patients showed that the clinically significant cancer detection rate was 30% higher using a MRI guided fusion approach versus truss. And the low grade, which is what we want to detect less of, was at a 17% lower detection rate when fusion versus truss. I think importantly, what it also showed us is that the area under the curve for fusion biopsy, which we see here, the standard biopsy and then the combined biopsy, really, really is uh, quite telling here that it's the highest for the targeted, it's the lowest for the standard sextant, and then the combined biopsy is intermediate. This was followed up by another paper in the New England Journal of Medicine that talked about MRI targeted or standard biopsy for prostate cancer diagnosis. And this is the precision trial. And this was a multi-center trial, randomized perspective in biopsy naive patients, which is a critical population for us to assess where we studied, where it was studied of MRI and fusion biopsy versus trust biopsy in 500 patients. And in this study, what it turned out is even a higher rate of clinically significant cancer detection rate um, in MRI fusion versus trust, and even a decreased uh, detection rate of lower grade cancers, which is those clinically insignificant ones. And so it showed that MRI and fusion biopsy was, was superior to trust guided biopsy. So what, what's the holdup? So here's, let's show you a modern multiparametric MRI. This is an example of a T2 weighted image here, an ADC map here, and the perfusion maps here that are generated. And what you can see along the anterior margin of the prostate gland is the classic erased charcoal appearance of an anterior transition zone cancer. What you can also see along the ADC maps here is that concept of decreased uh, or restricted diffusion and then abnormal perfusion characteristics. When this patient went to radical prostatectomy and they had a PIRADS-5 lesion, this is what the whole mount looks like. And just to orient you about whole mount, whole mount histopathology in our institution, the purple is defining the uh, Gleason-4 cancer, the green is defining Gleason-3 cancer, the blue is defining atrophy, and the red is defining BPH. And I think what's really, really interesting is it starts to get to the idea that MRI is starting to tell us what's happening at a cellular level. So if you look at this reverse C right here, that looks like the most restricted diffusion. That correlates beautifully with the highest degree of uh, Gleason score in this area as well. So it's a really nice example of what MRI can do. Not only can it find the tumors, but it can characterize the tumors. Another MRI over here uh, using high B value imaging, T2, ADC, high B value and perfusion nicely delineates a tumor along the right posterolateral peripheral zone here a little bit bigger on the T2, the area of markedly restricted diffusion here, abnormal uh, diffusion here, and abnormal perfusion here. This is a PIRADS-4, and on biopsy turned out to be at least in 4 plus 3 equals 7 cancer. So what are the new challenges and frontiers, right? MRI seems to have a lot of success. What we know today is that MRI is very good at diagnosing and differentiating between aggressive and non-aggressive disease. What we know is that MRI can help direct biopsy using fusion systems, and can aid in focal therapy and local staging. But I think what's really interesting is really where tomorrow is for MRI. 
And I think what we really need is a higher consistency of imaging and reporting. Quality is absolutely paramount. We need high quality imaging for um, the exam performance and also high quality image interpretation. I mentioned to you that the biopsy naive patient is a critically important patient for us to assess. Pro prostate cancer is one of the very few cancers where you biopsy a gland um, without evaluating it with imaging prior to it. And so the concept of pre-biopsy MRI and its utility is gonna be critical for us to show the importance of. I think we're getting to the point of really needing to talk about biparametric versus multiparametric MRI. I think the PyRedz committee started to talk about that in the most recent iteration of it, PyRedz version 2.1. Um, and I think the key thing to realize is that biparametric MRI is an expert technique. It is to be used by those who are already very facile and high quality in multiparametric. And as I mentioned, quality is paramount. We're gonna really need to talk about the importance of that. And then as we look towards the future, I think that one of some of the more fascinating areas here is how we incorporate AI for advanced diagnostics. People have asked me what I think sometimes the next big sequence is gonna be for prostate MRI. And I think that AI might be that thing to bring up the level of performance there. And finally, the concept of how MRI as uh, integrates with the new imaging techniques inside the space of prostate cancer uh, for diagnosis. And I want to just show an example of that. So here we have uh, something that I call not an eye test. Uh, there's a big pyrads 5 cancer, um, by pyrads 5 lesion along the anterior transition zone here. There's really no question about that. But what is a question is what is the staging of disease in this case? And what we have here is that we have an 11 millimeter lymph node in the right external iliac space. And that is certainly suspicious for METS based on the size criteria of eight millimeters. So in this particular case, we did a PSMA PET. And on this PSMA PET, what we found is that the PSMA is seen obviously in the bladder here, but it is not seen inside the lymph node. And so that really raises question as to whether or not this thing is actually a lesion or not. So you might say, well, maybe this is an example of a case where the prostate cancer isn't actually PSMA hot. Well, let me show you that this prostate cancer is quite PSMA hot. So this is an example of a situation where as we move from anatomy to function, MRI took a huge step forward. Instead of focusing on chasing dark spots, chasing shadows, we started to actually look at the functional imaging of um, diffusion and perfusion. We now need to start thinking about how we integrate the new functional technology of something like PSMA PET to get past the anatomy of lymph nodes and the morphology of lymph nodes and get towards the functional significance of those lymph nodes. So to summarize, I would tell you that prostate cancer today is in a better state than ever. I think we have more tools, we have better imaging, and we are, as radiologists, are in better position to help our clinicians and our patients than ever before. I would tell you that I think that MRI is key to advanced diagnostics in the setting of prostate cancer, um, that our current ch challenges really come down to quality and diagnostic performance. We need MRI to be the kind of test that is reproducible across centers and across countries. And um, one of the things that's really critical in this case here is that when we talk about MRI, doing bad MRI might be worse than doing no MRI at all, okay? Some of the new frontiers that we talk about here is gonna be the incorporation of new technology into comprehensive imaging solutions. I mentioned to you that I think AI is a key place here. And I also think that PSMA PET is going to have to be uh, engaged as part of a comprehensive oncologic imaging solution. And as to where we go from here, I hope that we can bring MRI to the forefront and into care models and help more biopsy naive patients get access to this technique and really hope that we can drive towards personalized medicine and give men with prostate cancer and their families the kind of care and the life that they deserve. Um, I wanna thank you all very much and I wanna thank Kibbem for their generous support of this webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. <clears throat> that was a really interesting talk. It's, it's really amazing. Um, how far we've come in the last 10 years, which you, which you covered beautifully in your, in your slides. And uh, we've already got questions coming in uh, on your portion of the talk, which is always a good sign, but we're gonna hold those questions until we hear from the other panelists today. So um, next I wanna introduce Dr. Juan Morote. He's a professor of urology at Valderon School of Medicine, Universitat Autonoma de Barcelona. Um, his area of interest has been prostate cancer from the last 30 years. During the last five years, he'd been involved in the development and validation of the new Barcelona risk calculator of clinically significant prostate cancer. 
And now he is working to improve the prediction of uh, prostate cancer from radiogenomics. So thank you, Dr. Morote, for uh, joining us today. And uh, let me turn the microphone over to you now. Hi, Dr. Morote, you're, you're, you're muted. Can you hear me? Ah, uh, yes, yes. Yes, okay, yes. sorry. So I say thank you very much for the presentation. And uh, my mission, my, my objective here after the speech of uh, Dr. Gupta is reinforce some aspects regarding the uh, current concepts of early detection of uh, prostate cancer. Uh, the beginning of uh, early detection or screening of prostate cancer is uh, from Bill Catalona in 1994, when he demonstrated the utility of serum PSA and digital rectal examination. This is the real beginning of the current uh, screening of prostate cancer. Um, However, uh, prostate cancer has, uh, the, the early detection of prostate cancer has evolved. It has evolved from the diagnosis, the early diagnosis of prostate cancer in the general concept to the current concept of clinically significant prostate cancer. This is very important. Urologists are only interested today in detect those cancers that really are dangerous for the life of the patients. And in this uh, way, this evolution has been involved in the uh, decrease of unnecessary prostate biosis and the overdetection of insignificant prostate cancer. Really, from the studies, the European uh, study of, uh, uh, of screening, the European randomized screening of prostate cancer trial, Especially before the uh, extensive follow-up, it has been demonstrated that clinically significant prostate cancer detection decreases the mortality of prostate cancer at a long term. This is the demonstration of the European randomized screening prostate cancer. However, in 2009, the PLCO trial against the positive results of the European trial makes that US Preventive Task Office position it against the screening of prostate cancer. It was due because they don't found any vintage, any decrease of mortality of prostate cancer and the observation, the positioning of US uh, Preventive Task Office was the high rate of unnecessary prostate biopsies at that time, and the associated mobility, uh, maybe by the infectious uh, complications and the overdetection of insignificant prostate cancer, what was at that time translated in an overtreatment, in an unnecessary overtreatment. That's the reason why the US Preventive Task Office in 2011 positioned against the use of PSA, which was not recommended. The current decision of prostate biopsy today is based on the information on the report of MRI, which has an important, a significant negative predictive value. That's the reason why clinicians usually, when we have a pyrrhus uh, below three, we decide usually avoid prostate biopsies. However, when positive um, MRI, usually urologists perform biopsies of those patients. However, it is important to know that predictive value of positive predictive value of uh, MRI in general is around 
That means that today, 60% of prostate biopsy in those patients are negative. And this is important or very important in this very high uncertainty scenario, which is Pirate Street, where only 30% of prostate biopsies are of clinically significant prostate cancer, moderate uncertainty when 40% of pirates 4 are uh, detected with uh, clinically significant prostate cancer. And of course, the effectiveness of pirates is obviously much higher. So there are some important key points that are important in the evolution of this concept of early detection of prostate cancer. Today, clinically significant prostate cancer. The guidelines establish that you can establish a man with a risk of prostate cancer when prostate cancer family history exists, when BCRA mutations exist, or when a PSA is higher than one at 40s or higher than two at 60s. Of course, there is a suspicion of prostate cancer when PSA is today higher than three nanograms per mile, or we can detect an abnormal digital rectal examination. And the decision of prostate biopsy today is based on MRI information. I said that Pirates three to five are usually subjected to uh, prostate biopsy. However, there exist uncertain scenarios. And another important thing today, the clinical guidelines recommend that approach for prostate biopsy must be transperineal in order to decrease the complications, the infective complications of prostate biopsy. So the current diagnosis of, prost of clinically significant prostate cancer include a biopsy that normally is a combination of guided biopsies and systematic biopsies. Usually two to four core prostate guided biopsies to those lesions detected by MRI and additional 12 core systematic biopsy. This is the reason why we use this scheme of biopsy. And when an active, uh, when an, an insignificant prostate cancer is detected, usually we subject this patient to active surveillance. The reason for the combination of systematic biopsies and um, uh, guided biopsies is uh, that we know that the effectiveness, the sensitivity of guided biopsy is much higher than systematic biopsies. Even in biopsy naive men and those subjected to repeated prostate biopsy. However, as Dr. Gupta uh, showed us, the combination of both types of biopsies is complementary and the number, the final number of clinically significant prostate cancer we, when we perform both types of biopsy is much higher, or at least is enough higher. So what to do in uncertain scenarios when the um, indication of prostate biopsy can be in doubt? Um, we can use PSA density because this is free and this is a good uh, predictor of clinically significant prostate cancer at no additional cost. New markers are usually expensive and needs of a new determination of serum or urine, usually after prostate massage for the determination. And finally, risk calculators that are attractive tools because you can combine the findings of MRI and you can combine with those 
clinical independent predictors. So this is important and this is an attractive tool. However, the, uh, the problem of, ex uh, of external validation for risk calculators are important because any tool which predict clinically significant prostate cancer is independent of the prevalence of the disease. So here you are the results of the new uh, developed Barcelona predictive model of clinically significant prostate cancer. You can see here that we can increase the discrimination ability of the model regarding the information reported by MRI. And we can find a net benefit over MRI and biopsy of all men. However, this is the first study which analyzed the results of this predictive model, this risk calculator, according to PIRATS category. And we have shown that in PIRATS 3, it is a benefit for the model and also a PIRATS 4, but we have small benefit in those men with negative MRI and also and no benefit in those patients with PIRATS 5. So the conclusion is that maybe those predictive models must be used only in those scenarios where they are helpful. And the big problem that I said uh, uh, is the external validation. And this is due because the conditions where you develop one predictive models are not the same in the population when the uh, model, when the predictive model, the risk calculator is going to be accomplished. So there is another key point, very important in the diagnosis of clinically significant prostate cancer. This is the, what is the definition of clinically significant prostate cancer? Remember that the current definition of clinically significant prostate cancer is based on the second consensus and modification of the International Society of Europathology before 2014, but this is based always on the Gleason patterns that were established by Donald Gleason in 1974. This definition of clinically significant prostate cancer does not incorporate the biological aggressiveness of the tumor, which is very, very important. And this is very uh, neat to have this type of aggressiveness in order to perform a good definition of clinically significant prostate cancer. So, which are, in my opinion, future directions of clinically significant prostate cancer detection. We need a prediction approach. We need prediction approach improving the current pyrats. Current pyrats is beautiful, is a good advance, but we need more. And then we believe that radiomics are the key point to develop new prediction tools. Secondarily, new definition of clinically significant prostate cancer. We must to analyze to include genomics, proteomics, or transcriptomics, any omics in the definition in order to define the true clinically significant prostate cancer. And finally, it will be the evolution of predictive models. So today we develop a predictive model in one area and we can use this model in this area, but now in others. Federated networking, including big data generated by the new predictive um, approaches, the integration in federated networking and the continuous feedback of these risk 
calculators of new generations. From the data generated in different areas, we'll produce the new risk calculators, which will be basically useful in all places where they are going to be implemented. So I conclude, um, early detection of prostate cancer needs today the help of artificial intelligence and all the tools of reading, especially uh, magnetic resonances imaging. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Morote. Very fascinating. And, and I just want to point out that, um, you know, first we heard from Dr. Dr. Gupta, uh, who's long experience in, in the radiology side of, of, of things. Um, sorry, I had to restart my video here. Uh, first, we heard from Dr. Gupta from the radiology standpoint, and now Dr. Morote from the urology standpoint. So it, it's good to have these diverse views um, here, here on the panel today. And, and, and we're going to get another view here from, from PhD, um, Dr. Boss Holskin. Um, thank you for joining us today. Dr. Holskin is currently Chief Technology Officer at Kibium. Boss has a dual master's degree in physics and biophysics and a PhD in physics from Radboud University in the Netherlands. For over a decade, Boss worked for Philips Digital Compu and Computational Pathology. He was a co-founder and CTO of that entity, and he brought the world's first FDA-approved digital pathology solution for primary diagnosis from all the way from ideation to a global market leader in digital pathology for Philips. Currently, he serves as CTO at Kibim, where he oversees the development of AI models for the prediction of clinically significant prostate cancer. So Dr. Holskin, thanks for joining. I, I will turn it over to you now. Great, Mark. Thanks for, uh, for the nice introduction. Um, let me try to share my screen while I kick this off. I am going to be grateful for a quick confirmation, Mark, if people can actually see my screen. Uh, yes. Excellent. So again, I'm really excited to be here today and to be able to talk to you about the role of medical imaging and artificial intelligence in the advancement of prostate cancer diagnosis. And it's great to follow uh, on the inspiring presentations uh, by Dr. Gupta and Dr. Morote on uh, the current practices and challenges of multi-parametric MRI imaging for prostate cancer and the current effort to build uh, prognostic and diagnostic models uh, for prostate cancer. So what can artificial intelligence add to this, right? What can a company such as Quibim add? Well, perhaps before we get to that, uh, a question first, right? Um, when there are so many different diseases, uh, so many different diseases where imaging plays such a crucial role in the diagnosis, uh, why would we focus on prostate cancer? Well, this slide, right? In the US, in the year 2022, there were almost 270,000 new prostate cancer cases. Globally, 1.4 million annual cases. That's more than breast, lung, and bowel cancer. There are 3.1 million people living today in the US with the disease or after having had the disease. And one in eight US men will be diagnosed in their lifetime. Um, Prostate MRI, as we've also seen from the, the great presentation of Dr. Gupta and of Dr. Morote, um, combined with targeted biopsy, leads to an improved detection of clinically significant cancer. And it can reduce the number of biopsy cores over a systematic biopsy. Even uh, it can eliminate, under circumstances, the need for taking biopsies uh, completely. But, that's always a but, prostate MRI does suffer from high examination times, a lot of time spent by the radiologist uh, to read the MRI exam. And a global radiologist shortage is, is looming. In the US alone, it is expected uh, that there will be a shortage of 
specialists such as pathologists, radiologists, psychiatrists of between 17 and 42,000 already in the year 2030. So it's really urgent that we have a solution that improves the accuracy of prostate cancer diagnosis uh, in a faster and more generalizable way. Uh, it, as we speak, one in eight US men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer during their lifetime. Every 15 minutes, one US man dies from prostate cancer as we speak. And the shortage of specialist radiologists to report prostate MRI is already there now. Oh, that went wrong, apologies. Because COVID-19 has only increased the waiting list, the workload and the delays in treatment for prostate cancer and so many other diseases, right? More than 50% reduction in the UK of men diagnosed with prostate cancer is the result of this. Uh, so the urgency is there. Uh, the time for AI uh, and for multiparametric MRI imaging to help prostate cancer diagnosis forward, forward, the time is now. So as we've been discussing, right, the most important thing that AI in MPMRI imaging can contribute to today is to drive the efficiency and the precision throughout the prostate diagnostic workflow. Well, how goes that? How to do that, right? So on, the, on this rather full slide, uh, I, I illustrate a couple of steps to discuss. It all starts with good quality data processing uh, and data standardization, if you will. Uh, garbage in, garbage out is uh, an important uh, principle that also applies to artificial intelligence. But with state-of-the-art motion correction, registration, and cross-vendor standardization of multiparametric MRI images, Quibin products today can give the best start with standardized objective quantitative data for further analysis, whether that's with AI or whether that's by a radiologist. Now, following on that, a very important diagnostic task is the precise segmentation of the prostate important for patient outcomes, but tedious when done manually, um, and also imprecise. Um, this is a great place uh, for AI to assist. Uh, uh, at instantaneous speed, AI can help with a high quality segmentation of the prostate gland, even separating the seminal vesicles, the transition and the peripheral zone, and parcelating that in the PIRATS 2.1 compliant sectors uh, to have a precise uh, prostate segmentation for the follow-up uh, analysis of the MPMRI. And the third step uh, on this slide, and this is really the heart of the matter when it comes to diagnosing prostate cancer, is to look at the lesions. This is where a lot of time is spent in the radiology exam. Uh, this is also where uh, there is a lot of interreader variability among radiologists. It's really a difficult job to find uh, those areas, uh, uh, those lesions in the multiparametric uh, MRI images. Now AI uh, in future products, uh, using a smart combination of unsupervised and supervised machine learning can really help to segment out those lesions, saving a lot of time of the radiologist, uh, but also reducing interradiologist variability by bringing the less experienced radiologist uh, up to the level of the experienced one uh, with the guidance uh, of such uh, uh, computer aided uh, uh, decision support algorithms uh, that can be made. Now, what will we do with all that data, right? If we look at the right hand side of the slide, um, th three obvious things come to mind. We can use that data uh, for semi automated quantitative and structured reporting. We can use that data also, and, and Dr. Gupta has spoken about it, to seamlessly integrate with the biopsy workflow eh? using the MRI images and the segmentation of the prostate gland and the lesions to directly do ultrasound MRI fusion biopsy guidance. Last but not least, 4.3 on the slide here, we can in a massive way extract imaging biomarkers from the original MRI sequences, but also from the uh, extra information that the AI models have added to this data. And we can use that biomarker data for in the future making even better diagnostic models and having even better models for treatment selection. So let me go 
to the next slide. I'll be a bit quick here. Um, Semi-automated quantitative structured reporting. Reporting is really an important part of the diagnosis and an accurate standardized quantitative report will do a lot for the outcomes of the patients, but it will also help to build a comprehensive data set with clinical information uh, and uh, the information from the structured reports that we can use to continuously improve the, um, uh, that we use, can use to continuously improve the standard of care, but also AI algorithms in the future. If we go to the seamless radiology urology workflow, passing the high resolution lesion segmentation data to the image guided biopsy taking, we can have more precise uh, biopsy, have lower risk of cancer uh, missed by misalignment of the needle, okay? improving the outcome for patients. Last but not least, the massive imaging biomarker analysis going from source images, but also the AI uh, derived data, such as the gland segmentation, uh, the lesion segmentation, functional information extracted uh, by the AI. We can collect biomarkers on size, shape, intensity, texture, function, hundreds of biomarkers that will allow us, well, one, to train AI models that are better able to detect uh, uh, clinically significant cancer in prostate MRI. We can use it also to evaluate and predict drug efficacy during clinical trials. And we can use it to build a real world evidence database with prostate MRI, clinical data, enriched with AI derived imaging biomarkers. We're not doing this alone. Cribbim is participating in uh, Horizon 2020 grant projects such as ProCancer I, uh, developing novel AI models such as ProCan 8, developing an AI based digital twin for prostate cancer diagnosis and treatment response but also working with a pharma company such as Janssen Silac to do AI model development to predict biochemical relapse in prostate cancer patients. Now with this last slide, um, I would like to sum up and conclude uh, at the hand of the quadruple aim of healthcare, which is really our compass uh, to guide us to a future of a better healthcare. Now, I believe that AI enhanced prostate MRI can really deliver on all quadrants of the quadruple aim. We have seen that pre-biopsy MRI combined with targeted biopsies can improve clinically significant prostate cancer detection and diagnosis and will reduce the number of biopsy cores. With AI, we can improve that accuracy and reduce the time spent, eh? driving population health improvements, outcome for patients, driving the cost reduction by having less radiologist time spent, but also driving the well-being of the care team, radiologist, will have uh, a better experience not spending those 20, 30 minutes reading the MPMRI case. But also with these future AI models on MPMRI, we can improve the accuracy and the efficiency of MRI for diagnosis and treatment selection beyond pirates, delivering also on all four quadrants of the quadruple aim. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to close and give the word back to you, Mark. Thank you, Dr. Holskin. <clears throat> that, 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 was a, that was an amazing presentation. I really love the way that you, you started off with the statistics um, that, you know, covering the prevalence of prostate cancer. It's, I don't know if amazing is the right word. I'd say amazing, but also troubling the prevalence of, of prostate cancer today. And, and, and also the, the, the burden of reading, right? With um, especially coming out of COVID now, that build up in, in cases. Um, all the medical conferences that, that I go to where there are radiologists, um, you know, I, I, I hear them talk about how busy they are today and how much they're looking forward to the next class of, uh, uh, you know, graduating class of uh, new radiologists that they come on staff every July. And that lasts about uh, a month or two. And then in September, <laughs> You know, when I see people at conferences, they they're talking about July again, just because there's there's so many reads and the and prostate is is, is so complicated. Um, so we're going to move into the Q and A portion of the webinar, and uh, if you have questions, please uh, add them. We've got actually some great questions already from from the audience, and I know that um, we've got a lot of folks out there, and and I see some members of the Pyrads committee that have that have joined the webinar. Welcome, thank you for attending. So. I'm going to start with a question for uh, Dr. Gupta, and this uh, comes from from a person who identifies themselves as a newbie. 
Um, and, and welcome to this person. So the question for Dr. Gupta, why do we want to decrease diagnosis for low grade prostate cancer? Intuitively, it seems early diagnosis is key. Um, so why is this the stage of, of disease diagnosis important? So I think, you know, particularly, I think we're, we're talking about here pyrads one and two, where there is there are suspected lesions, um, but perhaps not clinically uh, significant, Dr. Gupta. Sure. Yes. Uh, good question. So I think the key thing is in most cancers, we want to try and find every focus of cancer. <clears throat> and I think in this particular case here, one of the challenges that prostate cancer has faced is that because we were treating every focus of cancer for a very long time, we were actually treating some patients who didn't necessarily need to be treated because they were going to die with their disease rather than from their disease. We know that low-grade disease is not something that metastasizes. We know that low-grade disease is something you can live with. So the key thing I would say is we do need early detection, but we need early detection of disease that is going to change management. So as Dr. Morote talked about, the key thing here is clinically significant and coming up with a diagnosis that we can all agree upon is something needs to be treated and which needs to be watched. And the major reason for that is to decrease the morbidity from the over-treatment of low-grade prostate cancer. Um, your second question regarding stage, it really gets down to optimal treatment selection, right? So if you have disease that is confined to the prostate gland, you may very well be seeing a urologist. If you have disease that is not confined to the prostate gland, you may be seeing a radiation oncologist or a medical oncologist or some combination of the three, depending on what's there. And for a very long time, prostate cancer patients did not have access to imaging that would allow us to accurately stage their disease. And this is why MRI and some of the new technologies that we're talking about are so critical. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. And, and I've got a follow-up. I want to put a, put a human face on this question, okay? Um, two months ago, my brother in, in New York City called me up. He had elevated uh, PSA, um, and, uh, and, it, and they found an abnormal, uh, abnormality on his DRE. Uh, so they sent him for, for MR. Um, and uh, upon examination by an expert radiologist, uh, he had a, a PIRADS-2 lesion. So, so just a, a question for you. 10 years ago with MRI, um, would he have gone to biopsy? And Dr. Morote, um, please, your, your view here as you see fit as well. Would he have gone for a, a biopsy 10 years ago before we had MRI as such a critical part of the uh, diagnostic process? Sorry, Dr. Gupta, that was a question for you. Oh, sorry. So, um, and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Morote. I'd love to hear his thoughts on this as well. Um, I think the answer to the question is that 10 minutes ago, somebody would have gone for a biopsy as opposed to an MRI. I think that the key thing that's happening right now is there's very heterogeneous uptake of MRI across the country, across the world. And I think that uh, that's one of the issues that we have is getting more MRI into the more MRI access into the hands of more people so that therefore they don't have to undergo a biopsy prior to getting an MRI. The one thing I want people to understand about MRI is MRI is not mammography. It is not the screening tool for every man out there. MRI is the second step in the diagnosis of prostate cancer after tests like PSA. And But the fact of the matter is the key concept is here, we want to have an intelligent discussion about what should happen after you get an elevated PSA. Should you get an MRI? Should you get a biopsy? Should you see this? And so this is a really where I'd love to hear Dr. Morote's perspective. On a, on a patient like that, um, would you agree that MRI is not used uniformly throughout, Dr. Morote? In my opinion, today, MRI is the second step after the biopsy. You, 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 you need to perform an MRI always before to perform a biopsy. That's clear. That's the reason, that's the reason why, why in uh, uh, Pirates 1 and 2, maybe you can avoid biopsies because um, the current um, rate of clinically significant prostate, prostate cancer in this scenario, which are always biopsied by sextant, by systematic biopsies, are around 6-7%. But 7% can, can have clinically significant prostate cancer. 
So this is uh, an important aspect. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for those answers. We've got another question, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll send this to uh, Dr. Morote. Would you trust AI technologies to make a therapeutic decision if AI is based on a black box approach? Um, what would increase your trust of a predictive AI model? Well, at the beginning, uh, with uh, predictive AI uh, model, I will intend to improve the current standards for early detection. Um, um, the best predictive models arrive to sensitivity around 90%. However, that's not enough. Um, screening of prostate cancer has evolved in a few years, thanks, in my opinion, to the position of US task force. <laughs> because, because we have evolved. We have evolved to another type of early detection. We are not interested in the uh, diagnosis of insignificant prostate cancer. And, and one important thing is that we must remember 20 years ago, what happens with the diagnosis of prostate cancer. Many diagnoses of prostate cancer were Gleason score two plus two. Today, this type of tumors does not exist. And maybe, maybe in the near future, Gleason three plus three will be no cancer. So for this is very, very important, the uh, complementation of genomics to, um, to improve the definition of what is clinically significant prostate cancer. So we have two problems, to uh, predict better and what to predict. Great, thank, thank you for that answer. Um, all right, the next question is for Dr. Dr. Holskin here. And um, this is a question specifically on the, the, the QP prostate solution that, that, that you, you showed here. Uh, which, sequence, which sequences are used for this analysis? Perfusion or, or D, DCE? Um, are there other sequences and other techniques that are incorporated into that AI model that you showed for the QP prostate solution? A good question. Um, three series can be used, uh, the T2 weighted, the DWI and the DCE. Two of those are sufficient, uh, however, in most cases to come uh, with a good prostate gland segmentation uh, and a good uh, performance on the lesion uh, detection, uh, which is in a future product. And those are the T2 uh, weighted uh, and the DWI. Okay. The perfusion, as you were mentioning, uh, calling it, yeah. Okay, so the multiple sequences and, and not just perfusion um, that, that are used for the, for the model. Yeah, correct. Uh, okay. And it's, it's also the, the essence and the value, I, I would argue, right? Um, it is the combination of reading from these multiple sequences simultaneously to identify the lesions that makes it time consuming, uh, that makes it a job that requires a high level of expertise. Um, so that is exactly the right area for artificial intelligence to help, right? To make sense of that large collection of data and to assist the radiologist to navigate that data more quickly uh, and to find suspicious regions uh, more accurately. Okay, great, great. And there's a quick follow-up here. And I, I know I've worked on previous uh, prostate technology that, that utilized uh, a multi-shell pro approach and multi-B values, multiple B values, which, which required its own, its own particular acquisition sequence. And I'm, this question is about how many B values are you using on DWI and, and, and I'll just ask an additional question to that is, so how many B values do you use? Uh, is it PIRADS compliant? And does it require its own um, specific acquisition to implement on each scanner? I take it that one is for me again, Mark, right? 
Yes, yeah, sorry, Bass. I was uh, <laughs> no, no yeah, I was just continuing the dialogue here. Yeah, let me start at the end. Um, it's 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 part and an important part of Quibim's uh, IP core IP that we are able uh, to really process the MRI data sets so that we standardize across vendors. Uh, and that means it will be possible to use these kind of algorithms independent of what vendor MRI you have purchased, as long as it meets uh, the minimum requirements for the algorithm, which are similar to the PIRATS requirements, but a bit more relaxed. Uh, so you can be a little bit less uh, strict than with uh, uh, what PIRATS prescribes. Uh, that brings me to the second part of the question, uh, going from the back, I guess. Um, Yes, it, it, it is PIRATS compliant. Uh, the whole uh, workflow of the AI solution, the part that is there today and the part that will arrive in the future, is really intended to be PIRATS uh, V2.1 compliant. And as an added bonus, um, the software will even inform you about whether your acquisition sequences were PIRATS compliant uh, or whether uh, there are things you can improve uh, in your acquisition workflow. Uh, when it comes to B values, this is really a bit um, uh, too early to call and also uh, uh, internal information of the model. We are refining it and pushing it through clinical uh, studies as we speak. Um, uh, and you, this, this would be something we would settle on after, after that and, and decide whether we want to disclose that yes or no. Ah, okay, thank you. Thank you. I, I, I want to ask a question of Dr. Gupta, which is a follow-up to, to the question we got earlier from uh, the audience. Um, about the AI and, and trusting AI as sort of a black box model. There's a lot of talk, um, as you know, Dr. Gupta, in, in, um, in the conferences that I, that I attend about AI replacing radiologists. And, and is, that, is that a scenario that you foresee that, that we'll get to a point where the radiolo it will trust AI enough to replace radiologists? And um, you know, do you feel threatened by AI? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, <clears throat> I will tell you this, I have not lost a single night of sleep thinking that I'm going to be replaced by a computer or AI, but I have gained nights of sleep knowing that AI will likely make my job easier. And I think that radiologists who embrace the idea that AI is likely going to make parts of their lives better are the ones who are really going to be successful and those who think and they are in fear of, of the AI are the ones who are really going to struggle. Because at the end of the day, there are aspects of AI in our life today that have improved our lives. And the fact of the matter is, if AI does what it needs to do, it will improve the quality of the interpretations so that people are at a higher level overall. And I think that that's the key thing that we need to think about. I want to make a comment about the black box thing, because I think it's really important. Um, there needs to be extensive validation of the algorithms, and there needs to be some visibility into that, right? And that's just w w throughout the AI space. But there needs to be extensive validation of the algorithms because at the end of the day, as Boss said effectively, you know, garbage in and garbage out. If we don't have good data coming in, we will never be able to train algorithms to make it better. And so that element of there, and this is something that I credit Kibben with doing, doing a lot of that validation right now. And that is going to be critical in the uh, use of these algorithms. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. And uh, yeah, it, it, I'm glad you're not losing sleep on this because I, I, you know, the way that we see AI is, is, is helping radiologists become more accurate, but not necessarily replacing them anytime in the, in the near future. So we've got more questions, um, but we're, we're out of town, time here, and, and we'll try and answer those questions offline to the folks that, that have asked them. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. We're, we're at the end of the hour. I, I just wanted to to, um, to say here that, uh, again, to put a human face on this, I got a call from a very good friend of mine in, 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 in Los Angeles last month. And um, <clears throat> he called me and said, hey, you know, I have a history, had a history of prostate cancer. My father had it. Uh, I didn't go see the doctor. He's, he's 53 years old. I never went to see the doctor. I never got my PSA tested. And finally, last year, I decided to, to do it. Now, he's kind of a tough guy. Well, they found um, his PSA when, when he got it tested was over 10. Um, upon reading of his MRI, um, they identified uh, several Pyrads 5 lesions. The Gleason came back as a 9. 
And, um, you know, as a result, he had very serious case of advanced uh, prostate cancer, um, surgery, radiation, hormone therapy, and he's doing well, but it's, uh, things were, things were very, uh, uh, you know, dicey for a while. So I just want to encourage everybody in the audience, um, go see your doctor, see your primary doctor, get your PSA tested. Um, prostate cancer is real. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it, it's great. And I want to thank the audience here for the, just showing all these advancements that have happened in the last few years that it, it really make us more accurate diagnosing prostate cancer um, and providing the treatment available to those patients who need it and Im improve survival over the years. Um, and thank you to Kibim for sponsoring this forum. Uh, and, and again, thanks, thanks everyone for attending and, and we'll, we'll see you at the next webinar. Thank you to the panelists as well. Thank, thank you. you very much. Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And uh, we'll end here. Uh, good evening to those in Europe and uh, have a great day for those who attend from the U.S.